guys. Um, so I'm trying something new. I'm going to do a video because frankly I'm getting tired of typing things and I thought this would be a fun, interesting new way of doing things. Try it out. See how it goes. Um, there will be cussing because in real life I cuss a lot and also um, I think I might need to make a transcription for this at some point but I don't want to put it off for when I have time to make a transcription. I'm just going to do it now and if anyone needs a transcription I can make it in the future. So I've had a lot of, I've seen Zootopia pop up like everywhere recently. Let me hide myself. That's very distracting on my screen. Anyway, I've been seeing Zootopia pop up. So there's a local group in the city that I live in that is doing anti-racism education and anti-racism discussions with their kids <clears throat> and it's school-based. They're focusing on watching Zootopia as a learning tool for anti-racism education to get kids started talking about race. Um, our own school is also just doing a movie night just as an entertainment thing. And the PTO reached out to me because we run a little anti-racism group within our elementary school. They reached out to me to come up with some questions to ask um, parents and kids for as discuss discussion topics after the movie. Um, and then I also saw their local libraries also having a screening of Zootopia. So when I agreed to do these discussion questions, I was like, okay, great, I'm gonna watch this movie. Maybe there'll be a few problematic issues, but for the most part, we'll be able to come up with some talking points to get parents talking with kids and discussing about race and bias and whatever is supposed to be in this movie. So if you've seen this movie, it's really cute. It's adorable. It's funny. The jokes are kind of amusing at like an adult level. Um, but it's also like super duper duper problematic when you're looking at it in terms of it being explicitly educational or even validating for people of color. Um, <clears throat> if you've been following me for a while, you know that I categorize books into four different categories. One of them is normalizing, which are, should be the majority of the books that we're reading. They should be the books that have a soccer player who's dealing with going to the doctor and he happens to be black. Or a little girl who's having trouble at school and she has a great teacher who happens to be Asian person who, you know, is doing something they also happen to be in a wheelchair. These are wonderful normalizing books and there is zero reason not to have them anymore. But alas, all white boys everywhere. That's why Books for Littles exists. Anyway, the second category is explicitly educational. It's the one where um, someone, a white boy is actively reading what it's like to deal with mansplaining or a white kid is reading about what it's like, the, the uh, natural born citizen is reading about the immigration experience coming into this country, not knowing the language, that kind of thing. That's designed for the majority to understand the obstacles that the minorities face. Then you have validating books like Spork, which is as a multiracial person, you grow up not really fitting in on one side or the other. You feel like you're all alone, no one else has this feeling. And you read books like this and you're like, oh God, it's not just me. It's the kind of stuff that gives you language to describe how you're feeling and it helps you just kind of know that you're not weird and you're not alone. That Those kind of validating books are really helpful, especially for, um, there's a big group of books that are coming out lately on black hair and how um, black hair is something to be proud of and, and the microaggressions and active aggressions that you face with black hair <clears throat> is something that a lot of people face, you're not alone. So normalizing, explicitly educational, validating. Um, just okay. And then the fourth one is problematic, which a lot of people are like, we should not read these books, we should burn these books, we should get rid of these books, you know, everyone stop reading Dr. Seuss. But the thing is, these are the best learning and educational tools, if they're in the right hands. Um, so you want to hold on to those problematic books, you want to read these problem, you want to see these problematic movies because they open up discussion on like how embedded is white supremacy, is this network of things that we call the hierarchy um, of the patriarchy and white supremacy and ableism, all this stuff, how it links together. How is that embedded in things and how is that considered normal and how is that okay? Um, so. Zootopia, lately, people are talking about as an explicitly educational or even validating uh, story, but it's not. It's a problematic story and we should approach it from that lens. From that lens, it's wonderful. From like a ridiculous movie that is funny to laugh at with cute animals, that's also fine. <clears throat> but we need to understand the problematic themes in it so we can draw that our kids' attention to it and don't let that become an implicit understanding of what reality should be or that become the message that we should accept 
It is not a message we should accept. It should be something we're discussing and fighting. I breathe faster when I'm on video. Okay. So here's a little history. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. But to get into the, the movie and the themes in the movie, we need to discuss the history. Um, so there's a few different aspects of it. There's racial coding. There's the vocabulary that they're using against uh, what we're perceiving to be dangerous black men, AKA the predators. <clears throat> there's the issue of whitewashing and holiday, Hollywood. And there's also the deleted scene. So let's go through these one by one. In racial coding, you consider people of color as animalistic. And if you really think about it, you don't really, there's not like this one animal that people tend to go to when they think of white people. Because white people are diverse and all different and they're not a monolith, unlike somehow people of color where it's always a freaking Chinese panda or it's a black monkey. And <clears throat> from the very first cartoons and the first books that we ever had, people of color have been coded as these racial animals or as these animals and it's considered okay because they're like, I don't know why you're reading race into this. This is clearly just a jive talking crow in Pinocchio and just it's, it's voiced by white people. So it's okay. <clears throat> so from jive talking crows in Pinocchio to Chinese pandas and Zen shorts, I've got notes. That's why I keep glancing away to having a movie like Kung Fu Panda, which all the, by the way, is mostly white leads, which is just a huge missed opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and then you've got, you know, Disney saying, you know what? Let's do Hamlet in Africa, but we want white people to show up and we don't want to scare them away. So let's just make them lions. And let's also make the main characters white, you know, and, but the supporting characters and the bad guys, they can be black. That's okay. Um, so all of this feeds in very specifically. We're mostly going to talk about how black people are coded racially as monkeys and gorillas and basically these aggressive primitive creatures feeds into this trope of the scary black man, the brute, the criminal, the thug, all of these words that we use, especially liberal people like me, could use and argue we're not being racist, we're just using the word thug. But thug really does mean black people. Like when you use it, it's a racial coded word. So <clears throat> there's also some things we could touch on in terms of the ineffective slash smart, geeky slash wise mystic Asian, and also the invisible and harmless Southeast, Middle East, and Pacific Islander who don't really exist in movies like this, except for Moana and Lilo and Stitch, because Pacific Islanders are traditionally a safe and harmless way to promote diversity without addressing the issue of white colonizers on their islands. So those are good movies, but there, um, it's interesting to see how people approach these different conversations from an animal versus a human um, standpoint. So <clears throat> from the vocabulary of a dangerous, violent and dangerous black man, um, there's a history behind that, clearly. There's Hillary Clinton's super predators, which was just her way of saying black kids, where gang equals black or Latina Latinx kids. And you have to think about the fact that she wouldn't have talked about white kids this way. No one ever calls white kids a gang. You just call them like a troubled youths or something. So as a direct quote on the history of the word predator and how it relates to children, specifically male youths of color, um, Hillary Clinton's quote was, they're often connected to big drug cartels. They're not just gangs of kids anymore. They're often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal, which is just a nice way, like a, a really actually terrifying way of saying we need to put black kids in their place. So that's our history of super predators. The history of the heroin epidemic also kind of plays into this. <clears throat> Not like any of this was intentional on the makers, part of the makers, but it also speaks to the ignorance of what happens when you have a primary group of white men get together and talk about race is they don't know the history of this and what they're feeding into when they make a movie just like stumbling ignorantly through things. So the history of the heroin epidemic is it's a tool to keep lower income people and black populations in their place. There's allegories of the CIA introduction of heroin to create the crack epidemic and the myth of the welfare queen, <clears throat> which depending on whether or not you consider it a conspiracy theory, um, 
it plays really well and it's really hard to ignore and how that plays into this conspiracy of this sheep who is trying to keep down predators and put them back in their place through the use of drugs. So this suggests the white supremacy, the movie suggests the white supremacy is intentional rather than unintentional and that unintentional racism is somehow less harmful. That's not true. Unintentional Racism is just as harmful, if not more harmful, because you can't gaslight people and say that you're not actually trying to do anything against them. <clears throat> the movie suggests that eliminating racism is as simple as not being actively evil and overtly dis discriminatory, and that's not the way it works. To eliminate racism, to eliminate discrimination, we can't just sit passively by and try to be good people. We have to actually fight and dismantle things, because you can't dismantle something if you refuse to see it. Um, anyway, so all of this implies racism is caused by just a few bad apples, you know, you know, like, I'm not a bad guy, I'm not a white supremacist, and it's really easy to just dismiss all the things like not hiring people of color in your company, um, but racism is actually a system that was built on the foundations of exploitation and oppression, such as slavery and our school-to-prison pipeline that currently funds our economic system. So. <clears throat> it's really harmful to teach kids and to give ourselves pats on the back for watching movies like this when it actively teaches us the opposite of the things that we really need to know. So the third thing on the history is whitewashing and casting. I'm not sure if you guys are following this, but as an Asian person, this is something that, you know, comes up a lot. We have to disambiguate whitewashing versus missed opportunities. Uh, both of them are a form of whitewashing, but there's active whitewashing, where you have the movie Annihilation, um, which is either out or coming out soon. You have indigenous women and Asian women. These roles originally meant for this, uh, these women of color cast by white ladies. Um, that's whitewashing. Then you also have issues like Ghost in the Shell, where um, you have like my racist cousin who chimes in to say, well, you know, that character technically can take any body and any race, so it's okay that they cast a white woman, but the story was originated in Asia, it features Asian characters, and if you can cast any race of an actress for that role, why not cast an Asian woman? Why not cast a Middle Eastern woman? Why not cast a Pacific Islander? Why did she have to be freaking white? So, missed opportunity and all these issues. Um, people like Anna Mae Wong a long time ago and Chloe Bennett today are still fighting whitewashing of Asians in um, most media, particularly US American media. So a lot of people have to drop the Wong off their names or they have to play to stereotypes and take these really kind of shameful, harmful roles that do active damage to stereotypes in order to gain enough career and enough clout and enough power to eventually take roles that aren't about their race or that portray us in a role of integrity where we're not just erased from the planet. So ignoring that, Zootopia is a story about white and black folks because everyone else doesn't exist. <clears throat> racially coded white and racially coded black folks. I'd like to also point out that both main characters are white and I checked out IMDb and this is not going to be a perfect stat because I can't actually check the family history of every single ca cast member, but eight out of 55 people in this cast are people of color. The only somewhat main character is the chief, if you can even count him as a main character at all because he really doesn't have that much power. He's kind of ineffective and ignorant and clearly he was thrown in as a token. So all the directors, all the producers, the casting department, all the art direction, white men, with the exception of one white woman producer. Uh, one out of eight writers is a woman of color. The rest of them are white men. Um, Josie Trinidad, who is Filipino. Oh wait, there's another white woman in there. But here's the issue. So if you have one Filipino woman in a sea of whiteness, and assuming you can look at her as a monolithic per person who can speak for all people of color, which clearly you cannot, no one can. You have to think like, if I was that lady, I would not feel comfortable. And I would also not have the energy to educate this sea of directors, producers, screenwriters on the many, many issues that they are coming up with. And I would not really have a place to check them on that and ask them to just stop so much. Um, 
So it's unreasonable for us to expect that one Filipino woman out of this huge pile of white dudes and occasional white ladies is enough to check that privilege. Um, assuming she would even be aware of it because, you know, not all of us face the same microaggressions. Not all of us have the same lived experience. Uh, I would also like to point out that the animation crew, aka the cogs without power who are busy rendering animal hair and background and um, have no power say over the script or anything like that, almost exclusively people of color. So it's interesting to see how we stand on the backs of those people, pay them, you know, hopefully what I would hope is a living wage. But the people who are making millions of dollars off this movie, all white. Anyway, uh, the other part of the history to this is the deleted scene. So there's a scene called The Taming Party. Originally put in this movie, they had to get rid of it because it was really freaking dark. Um, there is a scene where a child predator, it's kind of like a bar mitzvah scene, where there's a big party and it's called a taming party. The kid gets a shock collar and every time they do something like too excited or too predatory or even like, I don't know, laugh at balloons or something, they get shocked. So what this scene tells us is that it's in a, it's in a predator, aka as we'll see later on, predators are coded as people of color. It's in a person of color's nature to be violent and aggressive. And it's only with significant outside moderation, literal shackles in this case, that makes them civilized, aka act white. So it creates the illusion of a before when predators, aka people of color, were actually dangerous. But that's never been true of people of color. People of color have throughout history been primarily victims of systems. And all of these ideas of the super predators and the scary black man are all founded on white fear, misinformation, and just nonsense. So I need you to remember this for later because this is also an important point. Only predators needed to change to reach this present day utopia that the movies take place in. That's an important point. Anyway, let's just stress, discuss the vocabulary of this movie. Predator, we discussed earlier. Um, but something to keep in mind is only the predators are the ones that go savage and only the ones that go savage are voiced by black or rather not only, but all of the predators who go savage are voiced by traditionally, uh, black and Latinx voices. So that's a weird message to send kids, isn't it? Odd. Um, there's also the phrase gone savage, which is coded language. Um, to represent indigenous people and enslaved Africans to imply a lack of empathy, inability to feel pain, and justification basically to treat them like animals. They, they're savages. Like, no one has ever called a white dude a savage. It just doesn't happen. <clears throat> then there's also the issue of the word primitive, which is just a fetishized and backward person. Uh, they return their natural and their base and primitive is always them even my friend who camps outside half the year and shits in the woods he's not called primitive because he's white <clears throat> civilized meaning in this movie and pretty much in pop culture means white westernized northern urban and u.s based more or less and then this is a side from the racial tones in the movie, but the term stupid, dumb, and crazy as a pejorative, which I know are common, um, these repeated pejoratives against those with me mental health issues, intellectual and verbal disabilities, they're just unnecessary. Like, why is that the thing that we use to rip people down? <clears throat> okay, so only the people of color, aka the predators, are ever called a predator, um, ever called primitive, ever expected to be savage in a natural state. Oh no. So, Zootopia is an allegory for race, and a lot of people try and argue this, say so we're reading too much into it. But the problem is, not only are we using it for racial education, and that's my main concern here, but also, uh, if you look at the history of the movies, the makers say they didn't intend to make this about race, but then they kind of decided to hop on the pop culture train and kind of cash in on this current wave of civil rights. Um, but they totally half-assed it. So, you've confirmed and since then, my makers and screenwriters have confirmed that it is about complicit bias and racial discrimination because they genuinely think that they're doing a, a good thing, that they're somehow educating us on something. And I, 
No one is walking out of this movie, no white person particularly, is walking out of this movie thinking like, wow, I have some work to do. I have to rethink some things. No, every single white person who walks out of this movie is thinking like, good, racism is bad. I'm good. I can just show this this to movie to my kids and I don't have to discuss race with them. How good. Now my kids know that racism is bad. <sighs> anyway, so as an educational resource, it needs to be problematic. It can't be validating. Um, as an entertainment resource, just whatever. So the mixed messages that this movie is sending, and this is the most dangerous part, is that on the surface, they're saying stereotypes and implicit bias are not okay. It's bad to have bias against weak bunnies who are literally weaker. It is bad to refuse ice cream to a predator because that's that's discrimination. But then there's an overwhelming number of examples of when it's okay to stereotype. For example, fat shaming, totally okay to have some laughs at the expense of fat folks because you've got a fat Sheena, he's lazy, he's gluttonous, he's not really paying attention to doing his job. You've got the redneck bully in the very um, beginning scenes where he's violent and, uh, violent and uneducated and he speaks with this southern drawl. And then you've got this barely restrained black, uh, I'm sorry, I mean predator, Fennec Fox Fennec, uh, and also you have all of the animals that go savage. So black people are basically barely controlled and I don't know, even know how they control themselves, but somehow they managed to not kill us and eat us. Anyway, then you've also got some Asian mystics, Tommy Chung um, and Gita Reddy play the elephant and the yak, both literally closed off from the rest of the movie and the rest of civilization, separated from the rest of the world doing like yoga and stuff, which is just like, seriously? <laughs> um, then you've also got poor folks who are low level criminals, such as, the uh, weasel with a Brooklyn accent wearing a wife beater. And then all Italians are Jersey Shore slash organized crime cast. Um, basically all of this separates it into an us, meaning the people whose face we're seeing, whose lens we're seeing the movie through, the, the white coated bunny, and them, meaning the predators and the weirdos who do yoga. Um, then we have, you know, white people of color. And we see all of this story through the lens of this bunny, which, if you back up, is through the lens of these white directors, white casting people, and white producers. So the main takeaway from the story that I'm really terrified that people are going to get is that our bias is justified, and that even though they say microaggressions are not okay, such as only bunnies can call themselves cute, don't touch a sheep's hair, it's not okay to refuse service to a predator, they actually do say it is okay, and that bias is founded in fact, which it's not. That just doesn't make any sense. So they're saying it's okay to stereotype because stereotypes are based on biological fact. In the instance of this movie, because they've coded us all as animals, yeah, they are based on biological fact. But since they're trying to teach that as a learning education tool, it's not based on fact because race is a construct. It, there is no biological thing that makes black men scary. It's just complete social nonsense. So you see the stereotypes that I already mentioned, but also all sloths are slow because they literally are slow. All foxes are sly. Okay, like the, the money has this um, part where she thinks the fox might be sly and then she feels bad about being discriminatory, but then he actually is sly. He's literally a con man. Um, bunnies really do multiply. Weasels really do cheat in this movie, and predators really can go savage with just one tiny pill. So, also can I also mention predators really do eat prey. So when you see this scene of like a, I don't know, like a tiger or something, he sits down in a train next to like a deer and her daughter, the deer moves away. Now when a Muslim sits down next to a white lady and the white lady moves away, that white lady is operating on myths and untruths and also she's being racist as fuck. But when a tiger sits down next to a deer, a tiger's grandfather literally did eat that lady's grandfather. So I think she's kind of justified in moving away. This is an issue. So real stereotypes are not based on biological fact. And this movie is kind of implying that they are. Um, second point, this movie confuses prejudice and racism. Racism is power plus prejudice. And this movie just completely removes the idea of systemic power 
they send the message that we're all prejudiced, which is true, um, except we can't actually all be racist. Racism is a systemic issue, not just a collection of people bouncing around with their own individual biases. It's about power. So you have to wonder, like, in this movie, who has the, the power? And they make it super confusing. The argument for predators being in power are, you know, the sheep who sidles up to the bunny and she says, you know, we little guys have to look out for each other and stick together. And you see multiple scenes in this story where bunnies and sheep have to work three times harder to get to the same position as the predators or the larger animals, which is true of people of color, of women. But the thing is that um, this movie kind of flips it upside down because they also point out a bunch of microaggressions where the prey are in power. So at the same time, in like within minutes of the sheep coming out and saying we are the majority and the prey are the majority, you've also got the fox feeling entitled to touch the sheep's hair. So who they're mixing up that power dynamic of entitlement. Um, and then you've also got the, the token Idris Elba voicing the chief. And you've also got the token lion mayor who's voiced by a white man, but they're kind of coding him as black. So this is kind of like the fox in the hen house issue where people who are against Obama were, would think that he was throwing white people under the bus to help black people. Now you have that same exact theme in this movie where the mayor is literally endangering the, endangering the rest of the population so that way he can squash any um, discrimination against predators. Oh, it makes me tired. Okay. So because these black coated people of the chief and the mayor are token people of power, it, they're trying to, it kind of is used as an argument against saying that people of color, predators, as a general rule, lack power, um, which is a really great way to reinforce white supremacy. Tokenism. Anyway, so basically the movie, in the movie Prayer Normalized, the predators were the ones who had to contort themselves and change in order to fit into this utopia. Um, so let's just move forward, understanding that the prey are basically white people. Predators are people of color. Um, <clears throat> they can refuse service to predators. Uh, there are stereotypes that cause them to lose their jobs, face microaggressions, um, have less opportunities. I think that kind of makes sense, except for all the confusion. Predators are the ones who are forced to assimilate. But then you have the issue where, like the bunny saying, the predator can't call her cute, only she can call herself cute. Which gives us the idea that racism affects all people equally, and it doesn't. Predators not being allowed to call a bunny cute is not the same thing as white people not being allowed to use the n-word, or women not wanting people to call them girls. Because, <clears throat> just because we don't want to be associated with being immature and ignorant as a woman, or just because black people don't want you to use words of oppression, from back when it was normal and okay to lynch and murder them, um, it's not exactly the same thing because bunnies literally are cute. And also there's not a history of lynching, murder, lost employment and housing and rape tied to the word cute. Um, it erases the power from the situation where they, they kind of muddle up this idea of who is oppressing who. And it reinforces this concept of colorblind fallacy where Usually it's white people who say, oh, I don't see color. My children love everybody equally. But the problem is there is color and there is race and there is discrimination against people of color. So if you're going to be willfully oblivious of this, um, you're willfully oblivious to systemic discrimination that affects people of color and you're, you can't dismantle what you refuse to see. So the story focuses from the white gaze and that's natural because all the people who made the story or white. Through the lens of the prey, Judy the bunny, we see this utopia which is only achieved when the predators behave. When they renounce what defines them as predators, literally they eat prey, um, and when they act like prey, they obtain Zootopia, this wonderful utopia city. So what that translates into black and white is utopia is only achieved when black folks behave. Renounce what defines them as black folks, Act like white people, utopia, which is literally what we're constantly telling black people to do. Um, 
And you know, it's worked really well for us Asians. We just act white. And as long as we act white and we stay in our lane, we stay, you know, assimilated, they won't hurt us. But as soon as we stop acting white, we get in trouble. We get killed by cops. And everyone just kind of ignores that because those are the bad people of color. So what we want to come across, what we want to gain from this is asking our kids, what does it mean when a group of white people write a movie about race through the lens of their ideal white utopia, coding themselves as harmless prey and people of color as easily triggered predators. And then by refusing to address the systemic component of racism, it's a huge missed opportunity to make this a learning tool. And instead, they call it a learning tool, and it's actually a circle jerk of performative fake anti-racism education, and it shows exactly how embedded white supremacy is in every single thing that we feed our kids. So that is my rant on Zootopia. Those are most of the things that I think I had to say, and I appreciate you for listening, and um, I hope to do something weird whether it's writing or some kind of recording, interpretive dance, I won't do that, um, once a month as just a general Petraean, Petru, Petru, someone else pronounces it differently and we are in conflict on how you pronounce it. I'm going to call it Petraean. Um, I would like to have something that isn't necessarily about books, so that way I'm not keeping content from people, but also you guys get a bonus thing that I kind of, it, like an experimental lab of fun things. So, let me know what you guys think. I appreciate you and I super like you guys.